الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم uh, so we left off talking about um, cooperating with the oppressors or helping someone oppress other people. And the author, he, where we left off, it said, it's also haram to help an oppressor whose oppression is not directed towards others. And when we think of oppression, it's usually one person towards someone else. But he says he is unjust to himself. For example, uh, to help them, they uh, omit prayers. They avoid fasting in Ramadan, uh, to drink wine, to do zina, to gamble, all of these things he mentions. He says, every type of sinner is being unjust to himself. H hence, helping him and being unjust to himself is also uh, haram. One who helps him is a partner in his sin. Allah says, help one another in goodness and piety, and do not help one another in sin and oppression. And be careful of your duty to Allah. Surely Allah is severe in requiting evil. Surah Ma'adah Ma Ayat 2. So we m must not help people or help enable people to commit sin, such as giving them money to buy uh, alcohol or to buy drugs, for example. You're not oppressing them, but you would be helping them oppress themselves. And uh, we uh, we oppress ourselves. We don't think about that. But when, when we read Dua Kamel, we say, Lam tu nafsi. Uh, you know, that I have wronged myself. I have oppressed myself, basically. So uh, sin, or ithum, as it's termed, is limited to the one who commits it, and aggression affects the others too, he says. So it comes under the banner of Nahi Anan Munkar to forbid evil. So we cannot help other people in, in evil deeds because we're supposed to stop them in evil deeds. So to help someone in any capacity is considered as a haram action, uh, one of the greater sins. For example, we sell grapes to someone with a specific purpose that we know that they will make wine with that. Um, another person may help some way with uh, without the intention of helping towards a sinful action, but he may sell grapes to a winemaker without the intention of uh, this being used to make wine. But if there's no other source available for the winemaker to get grapes, then the selling of grapes by this person is haram to do because it would contribute to that uh, manufacturing of uh, haram, of alcohol, of wine, and things like this. He says, is it allowed to help a sinful person <clears throat> by way of giving a loan or solving his difficulties to one who does not pray or is an alcoholic? Sometimes it's very difficult to decide as to what is the proper course of action in these type of circumstances because we're commanded to keep uh, a distance from the sinners. We see the Imam Ali alayhi salam. He said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has ordered us to be unfriendly with the sinful people. What, what, is, what is meant here is not agreeing with the sins that are being committed or being indifferent. I remember we had a narration from uh, about uh, Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam. Uh, Allah told him that he would punish 100,000 of his people. And I believe the number was something like 60,000 uh, were good people, but 40,000 were bad people. I think these were the numbers. But the majority of them were um, good, and the other ones were bad. So he said, why will you punish uh, the good ones, you know? I know the other ones are, are bad. They deserve the punishment, but what about the other ones? And Allah told him that they didn't, uh, they were indifferent, basically. They didn't care whether they sinned or didn't sin. They didn't show any um, hostility towards the sin or any, um, you know, they didn't, they weren't averse to their sin. So they drank alcohol, like, okay, whatever, we can still, we're still friends and we're still, we, we, they didn't say anything to them about all of the bad things that they were doing. They just let them go on. <clears throat> We need society to play a role in Nahi Anil Munkar or forbidding the evil by um, standing up against it.
for example, a government says, um, maybe the government says something is halal. It's not forbidden. They say, okay, you can do this. But um, the society goes against it. And the society is what determines a lot of things. Because if society will not stand for that, then the people will feel ashamed to do that action. I'll give you an example. For, for example, in Iraq, there is uh, nothing stating that a uh, woman has to wear hijab. In Baghdad, you see women with hijab, women with no hijab. It's normal there in Baghdad. But in Najaf, everyone is wearing hijab. They're wearing chador even. So if a woman goes there, even though it's not against the law in Iraq to uh, you know, not wear hijab, uh, if she goes to Najaf, she will feel uncomfortable by society. Society... People will say, what are you doing? You should cover, you should do this, a holy city, you know, think about your akhara and these things. And society will put that in check. So it, it depends on society. And when society is complacent with sin, that's where we see the sin increasing. So this is why we see Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam saying that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi ordered us to be unfriendly with these type of sins, not to agree with them. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, it may happen that in your social circle, one of your Shias does evil and you don't prevent him and you don't disassociate with him and you don't uh, do anything to him until he gives up his uh, evil deeds. So the, it shows that we should um, take a stance against that and show that we don't agree with that. We don't like that. We don't accept that. If we let them continue doing it, uh, then they will feel emboldened to continue in that action. So we should show some resistance against those things. Yeah, we have other narration says, one who helps a person who does not pray with a morsel of food or a piece of cloth, it is as if he has killed 70 prophets, the first of being Adam and the last of being Rasulullah. So this is a very strong hadith. And this is in the case that it will encourage that person to feel that the sin he is doing is okay and it is acceptable. And he will continue on and he will influence other people and uh, things like this. So we shouldn't, um, you know, be accepting of those type of sins being done openly and in the public. I remember um, <clears throat> in the prison... We had brothers who would uh, drink wine, and we had brothers who would gamble, and they were Muslims. But let me tell you, they, they wouldn't do these things openly. <clears throat> they would do them behind closed doors. This is between them and Allah. It is also haram, and we can, if we know about it, we should try to say something and stop them. But let me tell you the, the reason behind the difference. If, you, if someone does a sin in the house, this is between them and Allah, and it doesn't affect other people. It only affects themselves. But when one comes outside with uh, the audacity or the boldness to commit the sin publicly in front of everyone, then this affects the society. So the person, for example, they drink in their house. It's haram. They, will, they are doing a greater sin. It's between them and Allah. But it, the magnitude of that sin increases because when they go outside and they drink in front of other people, because then <clears throat> they are influencing society. And if society doesn't say anything, then they are uh, encouraging other people to do the same. Maybe they see that person says, oh, well, you know, Fulan, he came out and drank outside of his house. So, you know, maybe no one said anything to him. So maybe I can go outside and, and drink outside of my house, too. So it is another uh, level of, of the sin. We have hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that says, the one who smiles at a person who does not pray, it is as if he has demolished the holy Kaaba 70 times. So um, to encourage that person to not pray and say, you know what, you don't pray, but I, I don't really care. And, you know, I don't have anything to say about it. Uh, this is a greater sin. It encourages them to continue on in that thing. He also says, the one who helps a person who does not pray with a drink of water, it is, is as it 
is as if he has made war upon me, upon Rasulullah. So we shouldn't encourage them, we shouldn't help them uh, in their sin. If anything, we should help them by encouraging them to do tawbah, to do istighfar, to ask Allah's forgiveness and to turn back to Islam, let them know maybe they are unaware of the punishment of those sins that they are doing. Maybe they are unaware of the things uh, that they are inflicting upon themselves and on the akhirah. Maybe they are going through something and that's how they're dealing with it. And maybe they, with us talking to them and, uh, you know, welcoming them back to the community, telling them where we can support you, we want to be there for you, but, you know, you shouldn't do this thing. You should, do, you know, deal with your problems in another way and counsel them. Um, this is the way to help them. He says, other traditions of this kind are against associating with alcoholics. Uh, we do have narrations about the one who um, marries his daughter to an alcoholic, has severed the relations with his uh, daughter. <clears throat> so it's very serious about uh, these type of things. He says, the, with those who cut off relationship with their kith and kin and with liars. On the other hand, we have narrations that emphasize the respecting of the rights of a believer, helping and socializing with followers of Ahlul Bayt, salam, the Sadat, the progeny of Rasulullah, and the neighbors. He said, for example, it's obligatory to do Salatul Rahim or to enjoin the kinship or, you know, um, be good with your family. Um, and it's not necessary, it doesn't have a necessary condition that the relatives should be pious or not pious. And uh, he says we've discussed this already when we talked about the rights of parents. Even if they are unbelievers, we still have to fulfill our duties towards them. In the same way, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he said about the Sadat or Sayyids, um, respect my descendants. Be kind towards the righteous from amongst them for the sake of Allah and towards the non-righteous ones for my sake. To basically still show respect to them based on their um, kinship to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They still need to be advised, you know, even if one is a non-Sayyid and it would feel very strange, you know, that, for example, um, uh, I've had this situation before that, you know, I'm uh, only Muslim in my family. I'm a convert. I'm non-Sayyid, obviously. Um, but I have to advise Sayyid on, you know, uh, who have went away from the path of Islam and tried to call them back or Sayyid who's doing this or that. And, you know, but I still, have, even though they are... Um, related to the Prophet and they're not following it, someone needs to call them back and respect them and say, look, you came from this noble lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. It doesn't befit you to do these type of things and call them back to the remembrance of their Lord and remembrance of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa This is our duty on us. If we can affect the person, then we should advise them. Uh, Imam Rida alayhi salam, he said, uh, uh, about the uh, followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, be a friend of Ahlul Bayt, even if you are a transgressor, and befriend their friends, even if they are transgressors. See, so we should be kind to the followers of Ahlul Bayt, but we need to still, we need to call them back and advise them. And this is the way that we can aid them. Um, it says that we should aid the, um, you know, the person who is uh, oppressing, but how not in oppression, we should aid them in removing them from oppression and calling them back to path of Islam. It says, as far as the rights of the neighbors are concerned, we're told that if your neighbor is a Muslim, he has double rights on you. One of the rights is him being your neighbor, and this is his separate right. And then we have the other one that he is a Muslim. If he is a kafir, for example, disbeliever, then he still has one right on you that he is your neighbor. And we have to be good to the neighbors. He said, on this, on the basis of this, it's uh, incumbent to befriend the followers of Ahlul Bayt, uh, to help them to fulfill their needs, even if they are not pious. But we're not helping them 
in transgression. We are helping them in good things. Uh, he says we have to respect the Sayyids and fulfill our right towards them. And uh, even if they are sinners, we should still uh, respect them due to the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and help them, as I said, to bring them away from oppression, bring them from the darkness to the light and call them back to the thing that they have uh, lost. He said, secondly, when one is faced with more than one obligation at a time, uh, one should try to fulfill all if it is easy to do. If this is difficult, then he should fulfill the one which is more important. He needs to look at uh, the two things. Uh, for example, he says, when one is faced with a situation, when one is keeping a wajib fast and a child is drowning in a pond, both of these things are obligations. Uh, one, he is fulfilling this. He needs to fulfill his wajib fast. Uh, for example, he is fasting in the month of Ramadan, but then he sees the person drowning in the pool. It's wajib to save them. Uh, these are two wajib things. We need to look at ahim and muhim. Uh, one is uh, muhim is important. Uh, ahim is more important than that, the most important. So if he jumps into the pool, his head will submerge under the water and his fast will become bottled, according to uh, those who hold that opinion. Uh, for the sake of example, we are uh, using this opinion. But since it is more important to save the life of, of a human, it becomes wajib for the person to jump in the pool and save that person. Um, I remember one time this person... Uh, they, I, I believe they were um, drowning or they were choking. They were dying from something. And the only person there to save that uh, girl was a, 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 like a man, non-mahram. And they said, I don't want non-mahram touching my, uh, you know, my um, wife or my daughter or some what, his relative. So he didn't let the person help. But then the, the person ended up dying. It's more important, you know, this thing is removed in this situation because the life is more important. Life is more important. As we see, for example, it's haram for us to drink uh, blood or to drink urine, for example, because it's najis. But in the case where one is dying of hunger or thirst and there is no other option for them to stay alive, this is removed this uh, being haram is removed in that case, and they are allowed to do that to save their life. So it, beco it becomes something that is important and something is more important. So he says we need to do the more important thing, obviously. He says, according to Sharia, breaking a fast is a lesser evil than allowing the death of a human being. By doing this, he would not be liable for punishment of breaking a wajib fast. He would just need to make that fast up. On the other hand, he will get reward for saving the life of a human. So in joining good and forbidding evil, Amr ibn Ma'ruf, Wanahi and Munkar are divine commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're wajib for us for, to follow them. They are also, they are so important that in the case of their clashing with other duties, Priority has to be given to these commands. He says, if a, fa a mother, father, son, or some relative do not obey the divine commands, like making salat or fasting and these things, and if by withholding kindness from them and help from them, it's possible to reform them and induce, uh, he says, and induce them to give up their sinful ways, then it's wajib to withhold kindness and help from them. For example, we have a friend, and this friend stops praying, and this friend stops fasting, and this friend stops doing all of his wajibat. If we continue on being friendly with him, and we don't say anything, and we act like nothing is wrong, everything is sunshine and rainbows, then it will continue on with that. But if perchance that we uh, shun them a little bit and say, you know, I don't like what you're doing, you should pray, you should fast, what is this, what has gotten into you that you're not doing these things, and I don't like it, and you shun them, uh, some, withhold their your kindness from them, if that would bring them back to praying and fasting and wake them up and make them come back to path of Islam, 
than is wajib for us to do that. He said the same reasoning applies to Sadat, or Sayyids, neighbors and the followers of Ahlul Bayt, who have, uh, they have rights on us. But if withholding help is not going to make any difference at all in their behavior, then it has no point in doing it. This is the, the case with Nahi al Munkar. If in forbidding the evil has no, uh, it doesn't do anything. We know that it won't do anything. It's definitely not going to help them at all, and they will not listen. Then it's not wajib on us to do. But if we think it will benefit, then we it's wajib on us to do. He said, for these were withheld only that they may force the sinners to reform. Otherwise, there's no point in doing these type of actions. If one's parents and relatives are not in the habit of making salat and disassociating with them will not change them in any way, then it's haram to disassociate from them or disobey them. So it comes down whether you think it's going to benefit or not benefit. Maybe it could be the opposite case. Maybe if uh, you disassociate from your son, for example, who gives up praying and it's and that's not going to have any benefit on him. It, it depends on the people, you know. Sometimes it could have a benefit and it would bring them back. Should, you know, should do it. Then maybe it may not have any benefit at all. And maybe it will push them further away and they will go down a dark path of other things, drugs, alcohol, and uh, these things because they said my parents turned their back on me and left me. So we need to know who you're dealing with and what tactics to use in this, uh, you know, Amr bil ma'roof or nahi an al-munkar. So it all depends down to the person that and the, the people that we're dealing with. And we should know them and know and think about what the effects of this will do. If I shun them and withhold my kindness from them, what would be the outcome? Think about it, and you have to know that person. He said, we have to remember that Nahi and Munkar, forbidding evil, is more important than the rights of relatives, Sadat, and neighbors. So we should first uh, try to fulfill the duty of Nahi and Munkar, even if it uh, necessitates the non-fulfillment of the latter duties, which is enjoining kinship and uh, salatul rahim, being kind with the neighbors and the family, uh, this thing, uh, with family, I mean, pro provided that there is a scope of improvement among the sinners. So we should try, but if we see that it has adverse effect, then we can abandon it because it's not uh, serving the purpose and it is pointless and it could cause uh, more damage. He said, if it's not so, then it's not required to disassociate with them or hold with kind or hold your kindness from them. He says, as far and as far as possible, we should try and adopt a charitable option. If it's possible to reform a sinner through love, and uh, you know, through love then and help, then we should try, we must do this action. So before we resort to the harsher way of withholding kindness and help, which may be the first option that we choose, we say, you know, um, my son is doing this, my daughter is doing that, then I'm just going to shun them and and do the harshest thing with them. He said the first thing we should do before that is try kindness. We should try to call them and say, you know, sit with them, say, you know, uh, <clears throat> what is going on? Everything is okay. We love you. We support you. We're there for you. Uh, let us know, you know, wh what you are dealing with. Maybe you are stressed out about something. You can always talk to us and try this way. And if this doesn't help, and then you need to go to different stages in this. He says, for example, a father has a better chance of influencing his son who is not steadfast in his prayer if he tries to influence him gently. A gentle option should be tried before taking a strict measure against him. So we should try to encourage them with things, influence them in a good way, inform them of the benefits of salat and things like this before we go to the harsher way and tell them the punishments of neglecting salat and um, shun them and uh, things like this. Uh, all of these things need to be built, you know, from a um, young age. 
should instill the love of prayer, why they are praying, what they are saying, why they are saying it, all the benefits of Salat from a young age. So they know not just uh, doing it and following the actions and making Salat with no purpose and no idea what they are doing, except that they see their parents doing it. We need to instill in them the philosophy of prayer. Why are we praying? What are we doing this for? Who are we worshiping? Why do we stop our day to do this? Why is it important? What has Ahlul Bayt salam said about this Salat that is so important that it's called the Mi'raj al-Mu'min, the ascent of the believer? Give them books to read about uh, Salat or read books with them about Salat. To have some story time and share with them. He says, ending this, he says, in other words, when withholding kindness does not achieve the desired results of them giving up on that sin, there is no prohibition in being kind with them. In fact, it is an obligatory act and its omission is haram. So if we are kind with them and it benefits them, we should do this. If not, we should uh, be harsher, withhold our kindness, shun a little bit, not so much so that they think they can never come back, but, you know, show some uh, distance between you and them because of the thing that they are doing, and that is the reason why. And uh, we want you to give up this thing, and then you, uh, we will remove that barrier that we have placed, and maybe that will bring them back. And if, it, if that would have no effect on them, then we don't need to do that at all. But, you know, if we love someone and we see them going down the wrong path, we should try to stop them as much as we can. And we just need to know the person and what ways and methods we should uh, put to call them back and don't do the wrong method and uh, push them further away. So this ends... Uh, this chapter and uh, inshallah next week we'll start the next one uh, alhamdulillah we've made it to, uh, through 30 of them so far and next uh, week we'll